Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the Dictionary Podcast. Yet again, you will be hearing Greg Simpson talk some words to your ears. And um, I I got nothing. I'm recording these four intros and outros right in order, so nothing, nothing new to say to you. Let's go listen to him. Ready, set, go. Welcome to another episode of the Dictionary. I am your guest host, Greg Simpson. I have my own podcast called This Might Be a Podcast about the band They Might Be Giants. If you like them, check it out. This Might Be a Podcast. But today, we're actually here to talk about words in the dictionary. We're still on page 77. Here we go. First word, Athenaeum or Athenaeum. Noun from 1799. First definition, a building or room in which books periodicals, and newspapers are kept for use. Second definition, a literary or scientific association. And the etymology, this is Latin, and it is a school in ancient Rome for the study of arts from the Greek Athenaeon, which is the temple of Athena. Next word, atheoretical, adjective from 1969. It means not based on or concerned with theory. Next word, athero, it's a prefix. Atheroma, that's the whole definition. Example, atherogenic. Mm Mm-hmm. Next word, atherogenesis. Noun from 1953. The formation of atheroma. Not to be confused with the atherogenesis entertainment system (laughs) next word atherogenic adjective from 1954 relating to or causing atherogenesis you don't want that example an atherogenic diet next word atheroma noun from 1875 first definition fatty degeneration of the inner coat of the arteries. Yucky. Second definition, an abnormal fatty deposit in an artery. Also yucky. Atheromatous is an adjective. Etymology from New Latin atheromat or atheroma, which is a tumor containing matter resembling gruel. (laughs) Please, sir, may I have some more? From the Greek atheroma, or athera, which means gruel. Next word. Atherosclerosis. Noun from 1910. An atherosclerosis characterized by atheromatous. Oh, boy. An arteriosclerosis categorized by atheromatous deposits in and fibrosis of the inner layer of the arteries. Atherosclerotic is an adjective. Next word. A thirst. Adjective from before the 12th century. First definition, archaic. We just have the synonym, thirsty. Second definition, having a strong, eager desire. Example, I that forever feel a thirst for glory, which is a quote from John Keats. Synonym is eager. And the etymology from Old English, Offthirst from Arthirsten, which means to suffer for thirst, from of, which means off, or from plus Thirsten, which means to thirst. And there's more at the word of. Next word, athlete. Noun from the 15th century. A person who is trained or skilled in exercises, sports, or games requiring physical strength, agility, or stamina of which I have none of. Etymology, from Latin, athleta, from Greek, athletes. From athline, which means to contend for a prize. From athlon, which means prize or contest. Next word, athlete's foot. Noun, from 1928. Ringworm of the feet. Boom, get tough actin' to actin'. Next word, athletic. Adjective from 1636. First definition. Of or relating to athletes or athletics. Second definition. 
characteristic of an athlete, especially the synonyms vigorous and active. Third definition. We just have the synonym mesomorphic. Fourth definition. Used by athletes. Athletically is an adverb, and athleticism is a noun. Next word. Athletics. Noun. From 1749. Definition 1. Exercises, sports, or games engaged in by athletes. Second definition. The practice or principles of athletic activities. Next one's a good one. Athletic supporter. Noun. From 1927. A supporter, as of elasticized fabric, for the genitals worn by men participating in sports or strenuous activities. Gotta support your boys. Next word. At home. Adjective from 1951. First definition. Intended or suitable for one's home. Example. An at-home dress. And that's hyphenated. Definition two. Being or occurring at one's home. Example. At-home entertainment. Next word. Athon. Which is a suffix. Event. Or activity lasting a long time or involving a great deal of something. Example, a talkathon. Etymology. It looks like it came from the word marathon. Makes sense. Next word. Athwart. First form. Preposition from the 15th century. First definition. We have the synonym across. Second definition. In opposition to. Example, a procedure directly athwart the New England prejudices, which is a quote from R.G. Cole, my best friend. (laughs) Athwart, second form, adverb from circa 1500. First definition, across, especially in an oblique direction. Second definition, in opposition to the right or expected course. Example, and quite athwart goes all decorum which is a quote from Shakespeare, my other best friend. Next word, athwartship, athwartship, adjective from 1775, being across the ship from side to side. Example, athwartship and longitudinal framing. And our last word for today, athwartships, athwartships. Adverb from 1718. Across the ship from side to side. Step to the left, step to the right. Athwart ships, uh, they're just right. So, if I'm going to pick a word of the episode, ooh, this is an easy one actually. Athletic supporter. Mm hmm. It's fun because the definition has the word genitals. Yeah. So thanks, Spencer, for having me be your guest host for these couple episodes. Again, my name is Greg Simpson. Check out my podcast. This might be a podcast. Peace out. Thank you again to Greg Simpson for being a guest reader. I hope that you all enjoyed him. Uh, He is a funny dude. Go check out his podcast. Uh, They get off on crazy tangents, and it's a lot of fun. Um, And also, also, if you like They Might Be Giants music, it's the perfect place. So that's all I got. Until next time, this is Spencer, and again, sometimes other people, reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of the dictionary. Uh, First, I have not recorded in a little while. Um, I had a little break because, uh, well, A, it was Thanksgiving week, uh, which just was last week at the time of this recording, and uh, so I was kind of busy. And um, also the last four episodes were guest readers, so they were able to give me a little bit of a break. How did you like them? Uh, Let me know. Or don't. Doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Um, so, uh, because it's been a little while since I've recorded, uh, I'm, I have to get my brain back in this mode, and it is very strange. Uh, so, we are at the top of page 78. Let's see if I remember how to read. Uh, the first word is a tilt. And I feel like I had something else to say. But maybe I'll save that for the next episode, because I have to look to see where I wrote it down. Okay, a tilt. A-T-I-L-T. This is an adverb 
or an adjective, and it is from the year 1562. Number one, in a tilted position. Number two, with lance in hand. Lance is L-A-N-C-E. And there is an example, and it says, run a tilt at death. And that is from Shakespeare. I wish it told me what uh, play uh, it was from that Shakespeare wrote, Run a Tilt at Death. Uh, I certainly do not know, um, so I guess I'll have to look that up. Um, But if I were more of an expert, and I'm sure some of you know right off the bat what show that's from, what uh, act it's from, what scene it's from, you know all that detail. Next, we have, ooh, this is a fun one, a tingle. Uh, This is an adjective from 1855, tingling especially with excitement. Uh, Yeah, I'm all a tingle to get on to this next word, which is a suffix, A-T-I-O-N. This, I have to guess, is a very, very common suffix. I feel like I see that that a lot, Asian, A-T-I-O-N. Let's see, It, it, it means action or process, as in flirtation, something connected with an action or process, as in discoloration. You know, that's only two definitions, although technically it's only one, because I didn't say one or two uh, with two parts, one definition with two parts. Uh, But yeah, I I feel like that is a very versatile uh, suffix. Does the etymology say anything interesting that we want to talk about? No, it does not. So we are going to move on to atka mackerel. Two separate words. Mackerel is like the fish, um, and atka is capital A-T-K-A. This is a noun from 1888. It is a green, a greenling. Yep, a greenling that is a food fish found in Alaska and adjacent regions. A food fish found. Uh, So, I guess, you know, what am I trying to say? It's a fish. It's not a food fish. It's just a fish. So, I I feel like that part of that definition should be changed. It could be, it could say uh, it is a food, no, sorry, it is a fish often used in food, um, You know, all fish are food for something, bears usually, um, or other bigger fish, Um, but it's not specifically designed to be food, Um, although, like I just said, it's food for bears. Anyway, that that gets a little bit weird, but um, no, it's just a fish, Um, and the scientific name is Pleurogrammus monopterygius, M-O-N-O-P-T-E-R-Y-G-I-U-S. Uh, so sorry, I got off a little, tr- got a little off track with that whole food fish thing, uh, but I I thought that it should be adjusted a little bit. It's a fish, sometimes used for food. I assume they mean for humans, and this is from Atka Island in Alaska. Next we have A T L capital A. This is an abbreviation for Atlantic. Now we have Atlantean capital A T L A N. T-E-A-N. It's the first form. It is an adjective from 1667 of relating to or resembling atlas. Uh, And then a synonym is the word strong, Atlantean. It resembles atlas. Do you know who atlas is? I hope so. I think he's the, I don't know, Greek or Roman god who you often see holding up the world, Um, which is a sphere, by the way. Uh, now we have the second form of Atlantean. It's not Atlantean, it's Atlantean. This one is an adjective from circa 1828 of or relating to Atlantis. So whether or not you're talking about Atlas or Atlantis, uh, it, it has the same word, Atlantean. And it looks like they're spelled the same too. Now we have the word Atlantic. With a capital A, this is an adjective from 1594, 1A, of relating to or found in, on, or near the Atlantic Ocean. 1B, of relating to or found on or near the east coast of the U.S. 2, of or relating to the nations that border the Atlantic Ocean, as in the Atlantic Community. Obviously, there are a lot of nations that border the Atlantic Ocean, 
so I wonder if um, I'm just looking at the uh, the one B definition uh, found on or near the east coast of the U.S. Well, obviously we are in America and we speak English, and that's the book that we are reading. Uh, but I wonder if they use a same word or a similar word for the countries that are on the coast of the Atlantic Ocean in South America, um, Canada, in Europe, in Africa. There are many, many countries that border the Atlantic. We are going to move on to Atlantic croaker, two separate words. This is a noun from circa 1949, a small croaker of the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast. Are you sure it's not the Pacific Coast? Maybe it's the Atlantic Coast. Uh, the scientific name is Micropogneus undulatus. The second word was easier to say. Micropogoneus. I uh, just sort of wanted to emphasize it um, to make you understand a little bit easier. All right. Next we have Atlanticism. Atlanticism. This is a noun from 1950. A policy of military cooperation between European powers and the U.S. And Atlanticist is a noun. Next, we have Atlantic Puffin. This is a noun from 1931. Uh, Puffin just came up last night. Uh, We were looking at a metal shot glass that my wife and I got when we were in Iceland. And it had a little picture of a few things that make Iceland Iceland or things that people are aware of. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's got that penguin. And she goes, that's not a penguin. That's a puffin. I should know because I saw them in person and I got pictures of them. Um, All right. It is a small black and white puffin of the northern coastal parts of the North Atlantic Ocean that has a triangular bill with a broad red or yellow tip. Uh, So I wonder if these are the same puffins that we saw. Uh, because Iceland is in the North Atlantic Ocean. Um, I don't know. I don't remember if they called them Atlantic puffins or just puffins or some other kind of puffin, but I, I'll have to look into that. Uh, the scientific name is Fratercula Ar- Arctica. Fratercula Arctica. I know I'm saying these wrong, but it's just sort of easier and more fun to say them that way. Next, we have Atlantic salmon. This is a noun from 1884. And we have the 1A definition for the word salmon as a synonym. Next is Atlantic Time. This is clearly the episode of Atlantic. Atlant, Atlant, the, we'll, we'll call it the Atlantean episode. No, that's not even the Atlantic episode. Sure, why not? All right, Atlantic Time is this one. It is a noun from 1880. The time of the fourth time zone west of Greenwich that includes the Canadian maritime provinces Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. I I wasn't trying to be stereotypical when I said Puerto Rico. I was just trying to be a little bit more accurate um, because, you know, we say Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, um, but no, it's Puerto Rico. Uh, let's see, do nothing else to say about that. So that's the fourth time zone uh, west of Greenwich. Greenwich Mean Time is, of course, z- the zero marker. Um, and uh, I think Chicago, well, it, of course, depends on the time of year and daylight savings times and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so Chicago, I think, is mm, five or six time zones west of Greenwich. But again, it changes. Uh, so maybe sometimes seven. Next, we have Atlantic White Cedar. When I first read that sort of out of the corner of my eye, I thought it said Atlantic White Cheddar. But no, it's not cheese. It's a piece of wood. This is a noun from 1948, and we just have the number one definition for white cedar as the synonym. Uh, So if you know your trees, this is the one that's um, on the Atlantic, probably. Next, we have Atlantis. The famous, famous Atlantis. This is a noun from 1602. A fabled island in the Atlantic that, according to legend, sank beneath the sea. I know that there's a lot of people who think that Atlantis is down there, but I have a pretty good feeling that uh, it doesn't actually exist. I don't know about you. Um, Oh, interesting. So this is uh, Latin from the Greek, uh, from the word atlas. Uh, so the the Greek word Atl- Atlas, probably. Uh, and if, of course, if we go back to the beginning of the episode, we see that Atlantean is a word for both Atlas and Atlantis. So why did why did it change? Uh, is I don't know anything about Atlantis. Um, 
do they do they did they um bow to the god of atlas uh did they have a big statue of him where how did the word come from who who made this up who who where did this come from um i i'm so curious now i never actually thought about who the atlanteans were and what did they do and i never knew that it was related to the word atlas or the name atlas uh so now i gotta go check it out Next, we have at large. There is a hyphen between the two words. This is an adjective from 1969 relating to or being a political representative who is elected to serve an entire area rather than one of its sub subdivisions, as in an at large city councilor, also as in an at large election. I was always sort of curious what at large meant. Uh, normally, when I think of that phrase, I think of somebody who's, you know, like a, a criminal who's at large. He's out. You can't find him. Um, but no, this is a political representative who is elected to serve an entire area rather than one of its subdivisions. It still doesn't really help me since I don't know much about politics. Uh, I live in a co-op building and there's a board. And um, I think that there were... Uh, two board members that said at large like board member at large uh so where how does that word um what does it mean in that context do you know tell me next we have atlas with no capital a uh this is a noun from uh 1513 and we have a bunch of definitions in fact uh, this is going to be the last word for the episode. Atlas is the last word for this episode. Number one is capitalized. A titan who, for his part in the titan's revolt against the gods, is forced by Zeus to support the heavens on his shoulders. Of course, I mentioned that earlier, but he is a titan. Uh, he is gigantic. He can hold, well, in this case, it says the heavens. Uh, I've always seen him depicted as holding the world, uh, but maybe maybe it's not the world. Maybe it's all of everything. I don't know. Uh, but it can't be everything because he's holding it up. How is that possible? There's only one everything. There's only one everything. Um, all right. So why why did Zeus force him to do this? So many questions, so little time, so little space in the dictionary. We are going to move on to number two, which is also capitalized. One who bears a heavy burden. Number 3A. A bound collection of maps, often including illustrations, informative tables, or textual matter. 3B. A bound collection of tables, uh, charts, or plates. 4. The first vertebra of the neck. I never heard that before. The first vertebra of the neck is called atlas? Um, oh, probably because it is holding up your head, like Atlas is holding up the heavens or the world or whatever. Uh, interesting. I should ask my chiropractor about that when I go tomorrow. Number five says it's usually plural, so Atlantes, A-T-L-A-N-T-E-S, uh, Atlantes. And how how did they change the spelling of this? Atlas, the plural of Atlas is Atlantes, A T L A N. A T L A S. So, you know, what happened there? What happened there? Who who wrote this? Who made this plural? Um, well, that's clearly where we get um, Atlantis from from the plural of Atlas. Uh, but I still don't understand the spelling thing. Anyway, number five definition is a male figure used like a car carotid as a supporting column or pilaster or pilaster, uh, also called Telamon, T-E-L-A-M-O-N. Karyatid, is that the word? C-A-R-Y-A-T-I-D. Uh, um, yeah, I really don't know. Oh, male figure use like karyatid as a supporting column. Um, okay, so I sort of have an idea. Is it used in maybe in murals or sculptures or in buildings? They literally sculpt a, uh, a figure, often male, um, supporting the building or supporting the column um my dad actually made some art he he made a proposal for a mural that was would be put under um like a viaduct under train tracks um and it didn't get approved but i thought it was very cool and it was two of these characters i guess they would be uh at Atl atlantes uh 
um, holding up the train tracks. That was what it was supposed to look like. Um, I got us. Let me see. I, I have to see if I can get a picture of that. It was very well done. He's an amazing artist. And uh, uh, I'll have to ask him about, you know, did you call these Atlantes or Atlases or Telemons or what? It, what? What did you call them? Boy, I am talking a lot. And I'm going to end this episode. And thank you very much for listening. Until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Say hi, Ray. Hi. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the dictionary. Um, If you uh, were not aware or couldn't figure it out, I got a little distracted at the end of the last episode um, because one of my coworkers came in and uh, I just got super distracted. Um, So I did not pick a word of the episode. I just ended it very quickly. And uh, the word of the episode is going to be Atlantis. Uh, So if you are looking, uh, if you looked at the episode description, you will see that the word of the episode is Atlantis. But if you are not looking at that and you are just listening today, this is when you are learning about that. Oh, I think I just remembered what I was going to mention at the beginning of the last episode. Um, As mentioned a long time ago, I have a Patreon. I haven't really talked about it much because mainly because I didn't know what I was going to offer you um, as a as a benefit for becoming a Patreon member. But I do have one patron. I guess that's what they're called. I do have one patron. Thank you. You know who you are. Thank you very much. And uh, the, the, the easiest thing that I could think of at this moment um, as a benefit to you to be to be a Patreon member is to give you episodes early. As I've mentioned, I record these early and I I get them up ready to go early, um, but they just sit there uh, waiting to be uh, posted. Uh, So I'm going to post them here on, not here, I'm going to post them on Patreon as well. So if you decide to become a Patreon member, I think I have it set to be uh, at the $5 level. Um, That's usually, you know, from what I've seen other Patreons doing at that level, you tend to get uh, bonuses like that so i think that makes sense although if i get a lot of people who think that's just ridiculous maybe i'll adjust it and move it to ten dollars no i'm kidding um but that's where it's at right now this is a work in progress i have no idea what i'm doing uh so if you want episodes early go ahead and become a patreon member the link is in the description um okay let's talk about some words and this time i hope i don't forget to give you a word of the episode the first word for this episode is atlatl. I think that is how it's pronounced, atlatl. Uh, atl, 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 that's what I want to say when I say that word. A-T-L-A-T-L. This is a noun from 1871. A device for throwing a spear or dart that consists of a rod or board with a projection. Wow, that was interesting. I burped and spoke all at the same time. Uh, let's try that again. Um, that consists of a rod or board with a projection as a hook at the rear end to hold the weapon in place until released. Uh, okay, these are really uh, interesting, ingenious, old inventions. Um, 1871 is the first time that it's in the English language, but I'm pretty sure this goes way, 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 way back. Uh, be- there's a picture, and it's... Um, it just looks like a short stick, maybe about a foot long, two feet long, maybe depending on you know who made it. Um, and uh, it has sort of a notch at the end. So you hold it into your hand. On the other end, there's a sort of a notch and you put the spear or dart or whatever it is, you put the back end of that, we'll just say an arrow for easy description. You put the back of the arrow in the notch of the atlatl, which is a terribly fun word to say. And um, when, oh, and then you put your finger over the arrow, uh, you hold it back so it's all together, and then when you're ready to throw it, you basically whip your hand forward and let go, and it goes. Um, I feel like I've seen videos of this, but I never knew what the thing was called. Should we say it again? It's called an atlatl. At, or is it just atlatl? At, atlatl. Jeez. At little. Can you help me out? I'm going to look it up. This is from the Nahuatl word, uh, A-H-T-L-A-T-L. I think, I don't know if that's American Indian, uh, Nahuatl. I think it might be American Indian. Let me try that word again. At, 
Atlatl. Atlatl. Sure. Atlatl. Next, we have Atli, capital A-T-L-I. This is a noun from 1876. A king of the Huns figuring in Germanic legend and corresponding to the historical Attila. Oh, that's the end. Okay. To the historical Tilla, Attila. Uh, there you go. That's it for that one. Next is ATM, all lowercase. This is an abbreviation for atmosphere or atmospheric. And something else, which is our next word, but this one is all caps, ATM, all caps. This is uh, the first form of two. It is a noun from 1976, a computerized electronic machine that performs basic banking functions as handling check deposits or issuing cash withdrawals. And it is called also automated teller machine, automatic teller, or automatic teller machine. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but there are a lot of people who try to run scams on ATM machines, and you should probably be aware of this. They will often put, um, like, a the, the part where you put your card in, it's sort of this, like, molded plastic thing. They will sometimes put their own version of that on top of the one that is supposed to be there, and it will scan your card and that is bad. So um, when you go to an ATM, you should make sure that there's no fake uh, pieces sitting on top that shouldn't be there. Uh, you know, see if you can pull them off. All right, next we have the second form of ATM. This is an abbreviation for asynchronous transfer mode. What is asynchronous transfer mode? Have we read that? Uh, let's look back. A-S, A-S, asymmetrical, async. Where would it be? Asynchrony, asynchronous, we found that, but I don't see the other one. So I don't think that it was ever in the dictionary. We are going to move on to atman, A-T-M-A-N. This is a noun. It is often capitalized, and it is from 1785. One, uh, let's see. First, I'm, I'm going to look ahead a little bit. Uh, so both one and two say Hinduism. So this is a word from Hinduism. Uh, why th- maybe, I don't know why they both say it. I feel like that should be put somewhere else, but that's, you know, that's my preference. All right, number one, the innermost essence of each individual. Uh, we, in I guess in English in America, we would probably call that the soul, uh, but maybe there's a, a difference. But I, I kind of like this, atman, although it does have the word M-A-N in there, which I know a lot of people are not a fan of. Number two, also Hinduism, the supreme universal self. And then as a synonym, we have the number two definition for the word Brahma, B-R-A-H-M-A. So this is a Sanskrit word, Atman, with a horizontal line over the first A, and it literally means breath or soul. So yep, definitely uh, similar. And uh, it is akin to the Old English Itham, A-E-T-H-M, or I could say Ash, T-H-M, which means breath. Uh, so I, I, I like that. I feel like I've heard this in the past, but I would not have ever been able to bring it forward from the depths of my brain. All right, next we have atmosphere. This is a noun from 1677, 1A, the gaseous envelope, uh, or would it be the gaseous envelope? No, I think it would be the gaseous envelope of a celestial body as a planet. 1B, the whole mass of air surrounding the earth. Two, the air of a locality. Three, a surrounding influence or environment, as in an atmosphere of hostility. I try not to have an atmosphere of, of hostility whenever I'm around. Number four, a unit of pressure equal to the pressure of the air at sea level or approximately 14.7 pounds per square inch which is also 101,325 pascals, P-A-S-C-A-L-S. Uh, yeah, that's very scientific. Too much for my brain to handle. 5A, the overall aesthetic effect of a work of art. 5B, an intriguing or singular tone, effect, or appeal, as in an in with atmosphere. Atmospheared is an adjective. I like how this word... Um, can be so many different things. In general, I like it when words words have so many meanings. I guess it does make it confusing for uh, people who are not native English speakers. Uh, but this, you know, it can 
be talking about a work of art. It can be talking about a location. It can be talking about the actual atmosphere in the air. Uh, I don't know. I thought it was just interesting. Let's talk about some etymology. This is from New Latin atmosphera, which is from the Greek atmos, which means vapor, uh, plus the Latin sphera, which means sphere. So it is a sphere of vapor around the world. Um, And then, of course, if you're talking about something else like a work of art, it is the sphere of the feeling around that work of art. Next, we have atmospheric. This is an adjective from circa 1735, 1A, of relating to or occurring in the atmosphere, as in atmospheric dust. 1B, resembling the atmosphere. Synonym is airy, A-I-R-Y. Number two, having marked by or contributing contributing aesthetic or emotional atmosphere, as in an atmospheric in. And again, we are talking about an in, I-N-N, that has some atmosphere. Also, marked by an emphasis on impression or tone. Atmospherically is an adverb. Next, we have atmospherics. This is a noun from 1905. One, audible disturbances produced in radio receiving apparatus, radio receiving apparatus, by atmospheric electrical phenomena as lightning. Also, the electrical phenomena caused, uh, causing these disturbances. Number two, actions, as official statements, intended to create or suggest a particular atmosphere or mood in politics and especially international relations. Also, the mood so created or suggested. Number three, realistic detail added as to a literary work to create a mood. And I'm just going to say that one again without the parentheses. A realistic detail added to create a mood. Atmospherics. Like if I put some spooky music under this, those would be the atmospherics to create a creepy mood or whatever. All right. Now we are going to move on to at no. A-T, next word, N-O. This is an abbreviation for atomic number. At no time did I think that at no would be an abbreviation for atomic number, but now that I see it, it makes sense. Now we are going to move on to atoll. 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 I already said that one. It is pronounced a few different ways. It is spelled A-T-O-L-L. A-T-O-L-L. Yes, I just wanted to make sure I said it right because I've made mistakes in the past with my letters. Oh, it could also be atoll. Uh, This is a noun from 1625, a coral island consisting of a reef surrounding a lagoon. This is from Devahi. I think that's that's the Indo-Aryan language of the Maldive Islands. I don't know how to pronounce it. D-I-V-E-H-I. That's the language. Uh, And the word in that language is Atolu, A-T-O-L-U. If I'm remembering correctly, the Maldives are um, almost underwater uh, with sea level rising uh, uh, all over the world, which is definitely happening, and we definitely need to try and stop this. Um, The Maldives are going to be underwater very, very soon, and there's a lot of great people who live there. So, hey, maybe do what you can so they don't drown. Please and thank you. Next, we have Adam, A-T-O-M. This is a noun from the 15th century. One, one of the minute indivisible particles of which, according to ancient materialism, the universe is composed. Ancient materialism? I mean, isn't that... That sounds like a a, a, a fake religion kind of spiritual thing, but isn't it real? Aren't atoms real? Uh, okay, number two, a tiny particle. Synonym is bit, B-I-T. Number three, the smallest particle of an element that can exist either alone or in combination. All right, so now I'm realizing the mistake that I made. Number three um, is the scientific definition, but I guess number one is um, maybe that's the older version of the word. Maybe that's where we got the word atom to actually describe tiny little particles. Um, So uh, according to ancient materialism, that was the word that they used. Uh, And we just took it to make it actually true. Number four, the atom considered as a source of vast potential energy. 
and it is absolutely a source of vast potential energy. Uh, Einstein taught us that one. This is from Middle English, um, from Latin atomus, which is from the Greek atomos, from or atomos, that's the same word, uh, which means indivisible, and that is from adding A plus temnin, T-E-M-N-E-I-N, which means to cut. Uh, that's interesting. So usually when we add A to the beginning of a word, we make it the opposite. Uh, so cut, uh, the opposite of cut, would that be to uh, put together? Um, yeah, that makes sense because those are the things that when you put them together, make everything else. I figured it out. Next, we have the word atomic. This is an adjective from 1678, 1A, of relating to or concerned with atoms, as in atomic physics. 1B, we just have the two definition for the word nuclear as a synonym. It is not nu... Oh God, I can't even say it the wrong way. Nuclear is the right way. Nu... Nucle... Nu... I can't even... Again, can't say it the wrong way. Like a W would say it. Anyway, the example for 1B is atomic energy. 2A, marked by acceptance of the theory of atomism. 2B, we have the number two definition for the word atomistic as a synonym. Number three, synonym is minute, spelled like the word minute. Uh, this is why people hate English so much, because minute and minute are spelled the same way, no changes, and it all depends on context. Uh, four, and in italics after four, it says of a chemical element. The definition is existing in the state of separate atoms. And atomically is an adverb. We have, um, uh, let's see, we'll do one more. Atomic bomb is the last word for this episode. Uh, no, we'll just, we'll do two. Atomic bomb and then atomic clock. That's going to be the last one. But first, let's do atomic bomb. It is two words. It is a noun from 1917. One, a bomb whose violent explosive power is due to the sudden release of energy resulting from the splitting of nuclei of a heavy chemical element, as plutonium or uranium, by neutrons in a very rapid chain reaction, called also atom bomb. Number two, a nuclear weapon as a hydrogen bomb. Uh, I got nothing. They, they're, they're, those are big bombs and they're bad. Uh, they, yeah, moving on. Atomic clock is our last word. Two separate words. It is a noun from 1938. A precision clock that depends for its operation an electrical oscillator regulated by the natural vibration frequencies of an atomic system as a beam of cesium atoms. Cesium is S C. Sorry, cesium is spelled C E S I U M. Uh, whoever w thought of how to make these clocks or was a genius. I mean, it's and the fact that they work that way, it's so ridiculously amazing. All right, I have to pick a word of the episode. I promised that I would do that. Um, I'm going to pick Adam, A-T-O-M, as the word of the episode because that is kind of what everything is made of, but we know now that there are even small, smaller particles, neutrons and electrons and protons and quarks and things like that. Um, but, you know, in general, atoms are um, the, an easy way, you know, there are lots of different types of atoms, lots of different types of elements. Uh, they're fascinating. They're cool. They are what make us up. Um, and I, I think I heard that the, uh, the distance between atoms, I don't think it's the distance between protons and electrons. Or I think it's the distance between atoms in our body is the same relative distance between um, I think the planets in our solar system or the, uh, the solar systems to each other, something like that. Um, it's, it's based on their size. They are so very far apart from each other, yet somehow we experience it as physical matter, uh, something that can't be passed through. How is this possible? Um, I could talk about this for a while, but this episode is already almost 20 minutes long. What the hell am I doing? Um, I just find that fascinating. These things are so tiny, yet they are relatively so far apart. Uh, my hand won't go through this table or through this microphone. What is happening? How does this work? 
Anyway, that was the word of the episode. I am going to end it. Thank you very, very, very much for listening. If you want to listen to these episodes early, episodes, uh, go be a Patreon member. Uh, The link is in the description. Thank you very, very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to me talking to you in this podcast called The Dictionary. Thank you for joining me. I, I say thank you a lot, but I really, really do mean it uh, because I know this is weird and I know I'm weird and I know I talk a lot. Uh, so I appreciate you listening to me. Um, I know that there's got to be at least a few people out there who appreciate uh, what I say and uh, my sense of humor, my weird, weird sense of humor um, with almost 8 billion people in the world. There's got to be at least a few of you who are similar to me. Um, so I'm just going to keep on doing it this the way it comes out. Um, I, I sometimes feel bad that I talk too much, but, you know, it's just it's just what spews out of my face hole. Uh, so we are going to talk first today about atomic force microscope. Uh, that is three separate words. If it were one word, we would be, uh, it, it would be like German. Ger- in, I, I guarantee you something like this in German would be all one word. Uh, okay, this is a noun from 1986. An instrument used for mapping the atomic scale topography of a surface by means of the repulsive electronic forces between the surface and the tip of a microscope probe moving about the surface. And the abbreviation for this is AFM. Oh, this is fascinating to me. I, I guess I never really thought that something like this would exist. But, uh, you know, if I had, I would have thought, of course, of course they can do this, right? Um, so basically, like, okay, think about a penny. A penny is very small, or even a dime. The distance from the the lower part of the, of the was it Roosevelt? Is Roosevelt's face on a dime? We'll use a penny. It's an easier example. Lincoln's head. Uh, so the distance between the flat part of the penny to the, the peak of... Um, Lincoln's, I don't know what the peak part would be, his nose or his cheekbone or something. It's, I'm sure, maybe a millimeter at most. Um, And so this, that might even be too big of an example for this atomic force microscope. I don't know. Um, But it, it, it can map the, the distance to what? An atomic scale uh, between the heights of the, I don't, I'm babbling, but I think that that is Fascinating. I want to look into that because I want to see some pictures of topographies that they have mapped over on the atomic scale. Next is atomic mass. This is a noun from 1874. The mass of an atom usually expressed in atomic mass units. Also the synonym atomic weight. Next we have atomic mass unit. Noun from circa 1942. A unit of mass for expressing masses of atoms, molecules, or nuclear particles equal to one-twelfth the mass of a single atom of the most abundant carbon isotope, uh, which is 12C. So the 12 is comes before the C. It is superscript, which means it is above the letter and small. I don't know what that means. 12C. Anyway, um, it is called also Dalton. D-A-L-T-O-N. Sounds like somebody's name. Uh, I don't totally understand what I just read, but I read it. And we are going to move on to atomic number. This is a noun from uh, 1821. An experimentally determined... Is that the word? Experiment? Yep. An experimentally determined number characteristic of a chemical element that represents the number of protons in the nucleus, which is a neutral atom, equals which in a neutral atom equals the number of electrons outside the nucleus and that determines the place of the element in the periodic table and go ahead and go see the element table. Uh, I think this is similar to atomic mass, although it didn't really say that, so they're probably different. But uh, yeah, you understood what I just read, don't you? All right, next we have atomic reactor or atomic Pile, P-I-L-E. So I guess they're similar. Uh, This is a noun from 1945. And as a synonym, we have the 3B definition for the word reactor. Next is atomic theory. Two words. This is a noun from 1814. I have a feeling this is going to be a fun one. It's also on the longer side. But there's only two definitions. 
I gotta take a big breath. Number one, a theory of the nature of matter. All material substances are composed of minute particles or atoms of a comparatively small number of kinds, and all the atoms of the same kind are uniform in size, weight, and other properties. Number two, any of several theories in... I'm going to start that one over. Any of several theories of the structure of the atom, especially one based on experimentation and theoretical considerations holding that the atom is composed essentially of a small positively charged comparatively heavy nucleus surrounded by a comparatively large arrangement of electrons. <sighs> um, sorry if that was distracting, but I wanted to see if I could get it in one breath. Um, yeah, theory of nature of matter, all material substances, probably, yep, that makes sense. All right, next we have atomic weight. This is a noun from 1820. The mass of one atom of an element. Specifically, the average mass of an atom of an element as it occurs in nature that is expressed in atomic mass units. Again, go ahead and see the element table. Next we have atomize or atomizer spelled with a uh, sorry, spelled with an S instead of a Z. This is the British variation of atomize and atomizer with a Z instead of an S. Uh, it's been a long while, I think, since we've seen a British variation like that. They used to come up all the time. What happened to them? All right, next we have atomism. Atom with an ISM at the end. This is a noun from 1678. One, a doctrine that the physical or physical and mental universe why do they say it twice a doctrine that the physical or physical and mental universe is composed of simple indivisible minute particles number two we have the number one definition for the word individualism and atomist is a noun uh i think science has basically proven that this is right right i don't know it seems weird to say a doctrine. That just, it's science. I don't know. Um, okay, we are going to move on to atomistic. This is an adjective from 1809. One, of or relating to atoms or atomism. Number two, composed of many simple elements. Also, characterized by or resulting from division into unconnected or antagonistic fragments. As in, an atomistic society. And atomistically is an adverb. Next, we have atomize. This is a verb from 1845. It is transitive, by the way. Number one, to treat as made up of many discrete units. Number two, to reduce to minute particles or to a fine spray. Number three, we have the synonyms divide and fragment, as in an atomized society. Also, to deprive of meaningful ties to others, as in atomized individuals. I don't like it when individuals are atomized. A, they are turned into a fine spray, but also uh, when they're not, and it's the, the group is turned into a fine spray, the group of people, I should say, uh, then we're all separated. It's like, well, you know, the internet and so social media is kind of atomizing us, and uh, that might not always be a good thing. We feel more connected to other people in the world, but we're not really more connected, but we kind of are, but we aren't. I don't know. I go back and forth. Number four, to subject to attack by nuclear weapons. Atomization is a noun. Next, we have atomizer, and uh, I'm trying to figure out... Ooh, yeah, okay. Next, this is atomizer. It is a noun from 1865. An instrument for atomizing, usually a perfume, disinfectant, or medicament, M-E-D-I-C-A-M-E-N-T. Uh, I don't know what that is. It's probably used for medical things. All right, we are going to do one more for this episode. It is the word, two words, actually, Adam Smasher. Uh, this is a noun from 1937, and we just have the D definition, not 1D or 2D, but just D, uh, for the word accelerator. Um... The, I think the Hadron Collider, would that be considered an atom smasher? I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, so go look that up. Go look up what that is if you want to know. Um, so we had a lot of, this was all atom words. 
Um, I don't know what is happening. Um, all right, we are going to pick atomic theory as the word of the episode because, um, I don't know, I wasn't terribly paying attention when I read those two definitions, those two long definitions, uh, but it seemed kind of interesting. So that is the word of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Uh, goodbye. Hello, you lovely word nerds. I appreciate you joining me on this wonderful episode. Uh, we are almost in the year 2020. I think this is ridiculous. Um, I don't know. I just wanted to say that. The first word for this episode is atomy. A-T-O-M-Y. This is a noun from 1591. A tiny particle. That's it. That's what an atomy is. Uh, and we have the synonyms atom and mite. M-I-T-E. Uh, okay, next is atonal. We have thrown away the world of the atoms and we are moving on to another world. Atonal, A-T-O-N-A-L. This is an adjective from 1922, marked by avoidance of traditional musical tonality, especially organized without reference to key or tonal center and using the tones of the chromatic scale impartially. Atonalism is a noun Atonalist is a noun, again, and a, not and, atonality is also a noun, and atonally is an adverb. Lots of various forms. Uh, let's see, this is just uh, a plus tonal. Uh, so if something is tonal, uh, that is, you know, it's got tones, normal tones, the two are ears, and then we add a and it makes it the opposite. Uh, so this is interesting. Um, I'm going to try not to talk so much, but um, yeah, normally in music, there's a scale. There's a major scale or a minor scale, uh, and it, there could be, it could be mixolydian, or uh, I can't even remember all the different ones, but there are all these various major and minor scales. Um, and in America, it's very regular. There are half tones and whole tones, um, but in other countries... Uh, or when people are trying to be a little bit more experimental or abstract or something, they might use um, uh, the. I guess they would. Would they be con considered quarter tones? Um, and you know, halfway between a half tone. You know, there's C and C sharp, but there's halfway in between there in the frequency of those two. There's a, another tone. Maybe that's a quarter tone. Um, and so those are things that in America here we're not really used to hearing, but uh, tones like that are used often in, I know, Indian music and other other cultures. Um, and so we would call that atonal. I don't, know, I don't know if they would call that atonal. That's just normal to them. Um, but it's, you know, kind of an interesting use of music and frequencies and things. All right, next we have a tone, A-T-O-N-E. This is a verb from 1574. The transitive definitions are first. Number one is obsolete, and we have the synonym reconcile. Number two, to supply satisfaction for, and a synonym is expiate. And the intransitive definition says to make amends, as in eight atone for sins. Uh, let's see. The This is from Middle English, to become reconciled. And that is from at on, which is, wait, at on. Well, if we look at a couple episodes, no, that was at no, never mind. At on, which means in harmony. And that is from at plus on, which means one. Uh, why, what? Oh, at, no, I don't, I'm sorry. At on looks like it's two separate words, uh, but it's a thing that people say. Um, it's not in here as its own thing. I don't know. I'm a little confused by that. Uh, if you couldn't tell. All right, next word is atonement. Um, and um, as somebody described me, as described to me, um, one way that you can sort of say it is at one mint. That's how it's spelled, at one mint. Uh, and it looks like that is actually where the word comes from. Um, all right, so this is a noun from 1513. Number one is obsolete again, and it has the synonym reconciliation. Number two, the reconciliation of God and humankind through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, superstar. All right, number three, reparation for an offense, or no, offense or injury. Synonym is satisfaction. Number four is in the world of Christian science. 
the exemplifying of human oneness with God. We are going to move on to a tonic. It's like the word tonic with an A. It is an adjective from 1792. One, characterized by atony, um, at, which is the next word, but I just wanted to double check the pronunciation. Yes, it is atony. Number two for a tonic, uttered without accent or stress. So there's no tonic involved. Like a gin and tonic? A gin, a tonic. I want to make a drink called a gin, a tonic. Uh, next, we have uh, atony. This is a noun from 1693. Lack of physiological tone, especially of a contractile organ. What's a contractile organ? One that contracts? Uh, okay. Uh, this is from Latin atonia, which is from Greek atonos, which means without tone. Is that like tone of muscle? Like the muscle has tone? I don't know. Um, that is from a plus tonos, which means tone. It's kind of what we just read. All right, next we have atop. It's the first form. It is an adverb or an adjective from 1650, on, to, or at the top. Uh, number two, or sorry, second form of atop. It is a preposition from 1655, on top of. On top of Old Smokey. Um, yeah, they couldn't use atop because that didn't have enough syllables. Next, we have atopy. A-T-O-P-Y. This is a noun from 1923. A probably hereditary allergy characterized by symptoms as asthma, hay fever, or hives, produced upon exposure, especially by inhalation to the exciting environmental antigen. That was a mouthful. Uh, atopy. This is from the Greek atopia, which means uncommonness. And that is from atopos, which means out of the way or uncommon. And that is from A plus topos, which means place. And a topic is an adjective. Uh, there you go. Next, we have a suffix. It is A-T-O-R. Uh, this is, it means, one that does. We have an example. Totalizator. Totalizator. What a terrible example. I'm sorry, I've said that before. But what is that word? wouldn't you want to use a common word in the example? Sorry, I'm bitching about. All right, next we have a an interesting word. Atorvastatin. Atorvastatin, I think that's right. Uh, this is a noun. Oh, it's spelled A-T-O-R-V-A-S-T-A-T-I-N. This is a noun from 1994. A statin administered orally in the form of its hydrated calcium salt um, to lower lipid levels in the blood. And I skipped a part. I skipped the, uh, the chemical compound letters and numbers, which is, um, first of all, there's a part in parentheses, C33, H34, F, N2, O5. And that part in parentheses has a two. So there's two of those. And then CA3. H2O. H2O is water. I know that. Uh, all right. We are going to move on to ATP, all caps. This is a noun from 1939. Sorry, I just looked at my recorder to make sure it was recording, and it is, and then I lost my place. A phosphorylated nucleotide, uh, C10, H16, N5, O13, P3, composed of adenosine and three phosphate groups that supplies energy for many biochemical cellular processes by undergoing enzymatic hydrolysis, especially to ADP. And it is called also adenosine triphosphate. Next, we have ATPase. No, ATPase. ATPase. Yeah. So the eight, I was confused because the ATP is all caps, just like in the last one, but they've added A's, A-S-E at the end. This is a noun from 1946, an enzyme that hydrolyzes ATP, especially one that hydrolyzes ATP to ADP and inorganic phosphate. Next we have atrabilase, atrabile, atrabilase, atrabilius, atrabilius. I figured it out. A-T-R-A-B-I-L-I-O-U-S. Atrabilius. This is an adjective from 1651. One, 
given to or marked by melancholy. Uh, synonym is the word gloomy. Number two, we have these synonyms ill-natured and peevish. And attri attribiliousness is a noun. This is Latin atrabilis, two separate words, which means black bile, fun. Next we have atrazine. This is a noun from 1962, a photosynthesis inhibiting persistent herbicide, C8, H14, CLN5, used especially to kill annual weeds and quack grass. I've never heard of quack grass. Uh, do they quack like a duck? <laughs> All right, next we have a tremble. This is an adjective from 1862, shaking involuntarily. Synonym is trembling, as in, he was white as death and all a tremble. And that is a quote from Robert Coover, C-O-O-V-E-R. Next we have atresia, A-T-R-E-S-I-A. This is a noun from circa 1807. One, Absence or closure of a natural passage of the body. Two, absence or disappearance of an anatomical part as an ovarian follicle by degeneration. Atresia. Next we have, oh wait, there's some etymology. This is from A plus the Greek word tresis, which means perforation. And that is from tetrinine, uh, which means to pierce. And there's more at the word throw. Next, we have atreus, capital A-T-R-E-U-S. This is a noun from the 15th century. A king of Mycenae and father of Agamemnon and Menelaus. Mycenae is M-Y-C-E-N-A-E. -E. I think I pronounced it correctly. Agamemnon, that's easy. And Menelaus is M-E-N-E-L-A-U-S. Next, we have atrial natriuric, natriur, wait, no, natriuretic, natriuretic peptide. Atrial natri natriuretic peptide. Lots of vowels in that spot. Uh, this is a noun from 1984, a peptide hormone secreted by the cardiac atria that is pharmacological, that in pharmacological doses promotes salt and water excretion and lowers blood pressure called also atrial natriuretic factor. And the last word for this episode is atrioventricular. A-T-R-I-O-V-E-N-T-R-I-C-U-L-A-R. Atrioventricular. This is an adjective from circa 1860 of relating to or located between an atrium and ventricle of the heart. Now is the time that I have to pick a word of the episode. Uh, wop, 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 wop. I probably should have been thinking about this beforehand, but I didn't. Um, we are going to go with atonal as the word of the episode. Um, uh, but, 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 let's see, Instagram. Oh, you know, maybe I'll put a link of uh, something in, on YouTube or somewhere. Uh, I'll put a link in the episode description so you can go listen to an example of atonal music. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, 13 minutes or so is much more reasonable time than 20. Thank you for listening. Until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the dictionary. Yet again, I am here in front of this massive book doing no preparation whatsoever. Uh, so this will be fun. Uh, yeah, let's do this. First word is atrioventricular node. A-T-R-I-O-V-E-N-T-R-I-C-U-L-A-R. That's the first word. Second word is N-O-D-E. This is a noun from circa 1934. A small mass of tissue in the right atrioventricular region of higher vertebrates. That's us, I think, probably, most likely. Through which impulses from the sinoatrial node are passed to the ventricles. Sinoatrial, is that how you pronounce that word? Sinitrial, I don't know. All right, we are going to move on to a trip, A-T-R-I-P. This is an adjective from 1796. We are going on a trip. Uh, let's see, in italics, it says of an anchor. Uh, so you can go back and listen to the episode where we talked about anchors and the six types of anchors. 
Are there more than six types of anchors? I don't know. We have just a synonym that says away. So it's the word weigh, like you weigh yourself on a scale with the word a. Uh, anchors away. Next, we have atrium. This is a noun from 1577. One, the central room of a Roman house. Number two is usually plural, so atriums, or uh, yeah, in this case, that would be atriums. Uh, so 2A, a rectangular open patio around which a house is built. 2B, I think we're still in the uh, atriums world. A many-storied court in a building as a hotel, usually with a skylight. Number three, an anatomical cavity or passage, especially the chamber or either of the chambers of the heart that receives blood from the veins and forces it into the ventri ventricle or ventricles. And then it tells me to see the heart illustration, and I just told you to go see the heart illustration. Uh, that would probably be a good one for me to post on Instagram. Atrial, with an L at the end, is an adjective. Uh, by the way, you can also uh, pluralize this as just atria. That would be the more common uh, Latin form. Now we have atrocious. This is atrocious. This is an adjective from 1658. One, extremely wicked, brutal, or cruel. Synonym is barbaric. Number two, we have these synonyms appalling and horrifying, as in the atrocious weapons of modern war. 3A, utterly revolting. Synonym is abominable. A hard word to say. Uh, as in, atrocious working conditions. Yeah, I mean, if you're working next to like a garbage dump or something, that would be atrocious working conditions. 3B, of very poor quality. As in, atrocious handwriting. I don't know if my handwriting is atrocious. It's definitely on the border, though. I mean, I've seen atrocious handwriting. Uh, mine isn't quite that bad, but um, when I'm trying to write something fast, my handwriting is pretty crappy. Uh, let's see. Atrociously is an adverb, and atrociousness is a noun. And the etymology says this is from the prefix atroc, uh, A-T-R-O-C, or atrox with an X. Did I say Latin? It's Latin. Uh, that means, or those mean gloomy or atrocious, and that is from atrotter, a trotter, which means black, uh, plus the O-C or O-X suffix, which is akin to the Greek ops, which means I. And there's more at the word I. Huh, fascinating. Again, wh how is I related to our current uh, form of the word atrocious? Where did that come from? How did that get in there? Next, we have atrocity. This is a noun from 1534. One, the quality or state of being atrocious. Number two, an atrocious act, object, or situation, as in the sufferings, am I, did I read that right? The sufferings and atrocities of trench warfare, and that is a quote from Aldous Huxley. I know his name, I know somewhere in my brain what he is famous for writing, and I can't think of what it is right now, um, but you know, I, I know it somewhere, and I bet you know it. Next, we have atrophy. This is a noun from 1601. One, decrease in size or wasting away of a body part or tissue. Also, arrested development or loss of a, of a part or organ incidental to the normal development or life of an animal or plant. Number two, a wasting away or progressive decline as in, was not a solitude of atrophy of negation, but of perceptual flowering. And that is a quote from Willa Cather. Willa, W-I-L-L-A, just like it sounds. And Cather, C-A-T-H-E-R. Atrophic is an adjective and atrophy is a verb. Uh, well, atrophy is our main word, so it's both a noun and a verb. Uh, I actually know someone who got some fairly major knee surgery and after her knee was supposedly healed, um, her, her muscles, her quad muscles had atrophied uh, to the extent that, uh, maybe not all the way, but to enough of an extent uh, that she couldn't like lift up her leg uh, when she was like sitting on the floor. 
Uh, so she had to go to physical therapy and get this sort of electroshock uh, thing on her quads. And uh, eventually they, they came back to life and they are working yet again. All right, next we have atropine. This is a noun. Um, did I skip? I skipped some etymology for atrophy. Uh, this is from Latin atrophia, from Greek atrophos, which means ill-fed. Aha. Uh, and that is from A plus trephine, which means to nourish. So when you put the A on to nourish, it means ill-fed. Like your muscles that have atrophied have not been fed, and you need to nourish them with good, hearty exercise and protein and hydration. Gotta drink your water. Your body will not like it if you don't. All right, well, now is the time that we will move to atropine. This is a noun from 1836. A racemic mixture... Racemic, R-A-C-E-M-I-C, a a racemic mixture of hyoscyamine obtained from any of the various or any of various solanaceous plants as belladonna and used especially in the form of its sulfate for its anticholinergic effects as pupil dilation or inhibition of smooth muscle spasms. I'm not really sure... What any of what I just said is, uh, I mean, I understand pupil dilation and muscle spasms and things, but it's a it's a thing that happens in your body. Uh, let's see. This is from New Latin atropa, which is the genus name of belladonna, which is from the Greek atropos, uh, which is one of the three fates. What are the three fates? Uh, well, one of them is atropos. Uh, but what does that mean? What does it do? Is it a person? Is it a thing? What are the other two? I need to learn these things. I have so much to learn. I'm old, yet there is so much I don't know about the world. I've been so sheltered. I've sheltered myself. I don't know. All right, next we have two words. At sign, S-I-G-N. This is a noun from 1982. The symbol, at, the the at symbol, especially, (laughs) now it all makes sense. It's the at sign. I thought it was like at sign, like you're signing a contract. It's the at sign. Uh, Okay, the symbol, at, especially when used as part of an internet user's email address. And I can assume, I think, that uh, all of us are very familiar with that sign. Ah, that at sign. Okay, next we have ATT, all lowercase. It is the first form, and it is a variation of the word at with one T. And now we have the second form of ATT. It is an abbreviation for one, attached, two, attention, and three, attorney. Do you have an attached attorney who's at attention? All right, next we have attaboy. Uh, and I'm just checking to see where I'm going to end this episode. Okay, attaboy, A-T-T-A-B-O-Y, not something that I would have expected to see in the dictionary. This is an interjection from 1909, used to express encouragement, approval, or admiration. The etymology says this is probably an alternative of that's the boy. Uh, okay. I, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Uh, when I'm thinking about what I would have thought it was from, I honestly can't think of something. That a boy, that, there you go, boy, do that thing up at the batter's thing, or whatever. That's the boy. Strange. People talked so weird 110 years ago. 110 years ago! Jesus. Okay, we are going to do one more for this word. It is the word attach, A-T-T-A-C-H. Uh, this is a verb from the 14th century. I feel like I haven't seen that in a while. Uh, all right, we're going to start with the transitive definitions. One, to take by legal authority, especially under a writ. Writ is spelled W-R-I-T, as in attached the property. Two, a To bring oneself into an association. Uh, I lost my place. As in, attached herself to their cause. To be. To assign an individual or unit in the military temporarily. So without the parentheses, it says to assign temporarily. And then the parentheses says an individual or unit in the military. Number three. To bind by personal ties. As of affection or sympathy. As in was strongly attached to his family. Number four, to make fast as by trying or gluing. And I feel a burp coming on. There we go. I just had some food not that long ago, so excuse me and pardon me. 
Um, all right, so to make fast, as by tying or gluing. I think I said trying before. Uh, as in, attach a label to a package. Uh, stamps would be a perfect example of that. Do you use stamps anymore? Does anybody use stamps anymore? I do rarely, uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a thing that people used to use. Uh, all right, number five, to associate, especially as a property or an attribute. Uh, and then a synonym is ascribe, as in attached great importance to public opinion polls. And lastly, we have one intransitive definition, which says to become attached. And a synonym for that is adhere. And then we have another final synonym after all of that funness is the word fasten. Attachable is an adjective. And the etymology says this is from Anglo-French attacher, which uh, is an alternative of the Old French estachier, uh, which is from estache, which means stake. And that is from that is of Germanic origin, which is akin to the Old English staka, which means stake. And that is everything for that. Um, I feel like I want to go pick atrocious as the word of the episode because, I don't know, it's just a fun word and calling something atrocious is has always been a good time in my book. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, check out the Instagram and the things get posted to Twitter and Facebook. And if you want to get these episodes early, uh, which is basically as soon as I'm able to go through them and post them, uh, they will be on Patreon. So if you want those early, go to Patreon and do the thing with, with the stuff. All right. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. What's up? How you doing? Let us do this thing with the dictionary. Not that thing, the other thing. First word is attaché. Uh, I think the first time I heard this word was in the movie The Birdcage, uh, which, you know, it's a little bit old and dated at this point, but uh, it's still a very good and funny movie with some amazing actors. Uh, all right, A-T-T-A-C-H-E with an accent over the E. It goes up and to the right. Uh, and there's there are some great lines in that movie, especially from Hank Azaria. Uh, if I think of one, maybe I'll say it. Uh, all right, attaché, this is a noun from 1826. One, a technical expert on a country's diplomatic staff at a foreign capital, as in a military attaché. And number two, we just have the synonym attaché case. Uh, and let's see, this is from the French uh, verb attacher. Attaché case is the next word it is a noun from 1904 one a small thin suitcase used especially for carrying business papers number two is just the synonym briefcase uh it's such a it's a fancy way to say briefcase that's pretty much it uh, i i will never probably carry an attache case because i am not businessman next we have attached this is an adjective from 1854 Permanently fixed when adult, as in attached barnacles. Permanently fixed when adult. Uh, so I guess when barnacles are not adult, uh, they are not permanently fixed. Sure. Uh, okay, next we have attachment. This is a noun from the 14th century. One, a seizure by legal process. Uh, also, the writ or precept commanding such seizure. And that is not the seizure uh, when somebody is spasming on the floor. Um, ooh, that just bring back, brought back some bad memories when a friend of ours actually had a seizure in the back of our car. Ugh, that, that was an insanely scary situation, but she's okay. Um, okay, this is the seizure when they have to legally have to take something away from you. 2A, the state of being personally attached. Synonym is fidelity, as in... Attachment to a cause. To be affectionate regard. That's it. As in a deep attachment to nature. See, they don't have periods at the end of the definitions. Probably, literally, I, I've said this before, to save on ink. Uh, they use so much ink for this book uh, that even just adding periods would waste a lot of ink. Um, so, yeah, I don't always know when the end of the definition is and when it's at the end of a line um, or something like that. I, I, I am not aware that the um, definition has ended. I just need to do a better job at looking ahead. Number three, a device attached to a machine or implement. Number four, 
the physical connection by which one thing is attached to another. 5. The process of physically attaching. Next, we have a long one. This is the word attack. It is the first form of three, and it has some extra synonym information at the end. All right, this is a verb from 1562. We will start with the transitive definitions. One, to set upon, or s no, I skipped a line, or I went back a line. To set upon, or work against forcefully. Two, to assail with unfriendly or bitter words. Three, to begin to effect or to act on injurious, injuriously. I'm going to read that one again. Number three, to begin to affect or to act on injuriously. As in, plants attacked by aphids. The plants don't like it when they get attacked by aphids. They've told them many, many times, and they just won't listen, those silly aphids. Number four, to set to work on. As in, attack a problem. Five, to threaten a piece in chess with immediate capture. And I have to clarify, the part in parentheses was a piece in chess. Uh, and so all together, it says to threaten with immediate capture. And they are talking about an example is a piece in chess. And now we have an intransitive definition. It says to make an attack. And attacker is a noun. This is from Middle French attaquer, which is spelled A-T-T-A-Q-U-E-R, which is from the Old English uh, estachare. It's, it's a double C, which I think is a ch sound, estachare, uh, which means to attach. Uh, and that is from staka or stacha, which means stake, which we saw recently. Uh, that is of Germanic origin, and it is akin to the Old English staka with one C. Uh, there is a star before the word estachare, um, and I don't know why. Is that... What, what, what is that in relation to? I don't know. Anyway... Let's read the synonym information for attack. It says, attack, assail, assault, bombard, and storm mean to make an onslaught upon. Attack implies taking the initiative in a struggle, as in plan to attack the town at dawn. Assail implies attempting to break down resistance by repeated blows or shots, as in assailed the enemy with artillery fire. Assault suggests a direct attempt to overpower by suddenness and violence of onslaught. Onslaught. As in, commandos assaulted the building from all sides. Bombard applies to attacking with bombs. As I, bombard applies to attacking with bombs or shells. As in, bombarded the city nightly. Storm implies attempting to break into a defended position. As in, preparing to storm the fortress. Uh, and what is that line from The Princess Bride? Have fun storming the castle! Yeah, I think they say storming in that case. Do you think it'll work? It would take a miracle. Bye bye Next, we have the second form of attack. This is a noun from 1655. One, the act of attacking with physical force or unfriendly words. Ooh, words are, can be very unfriendly. And we have the synonym, the word assault. Number two, a belligerent or antagonistic action. 3a, a fit of sickness, especially an active episode of a chronic or recurrent disease. Yes. Uh, 3b, a person of being strongly affected by something. A person, no, sorry, my brain is not reading correctly. A period of being strongly affected by something as a desire or mood. 4a, an offensive or scoring action, as in, won the game with an eight-hit attack. What What is an eight-hit attack? Is that, uh, is that like a, a video game, like Mortal Kombat, you get an eight-hit combo attack? Um, or uh, in what, what other game would there be that you win by an eight-hit attack? Uh, 4B, offensive players or the positions taken up by them or by them. Five, the setting to work on some undertaking, as in, made a new attack on the problem. Previously, we attacked the problem, and now we made a new attack on the problem. Six, the beginning of destructive action, as by a chemical agent. And number seven, the act or manner of beginning a musical tone or phrase. Ah, yes, I am familiar with that. Uh, when, when you first hit a note with whatever uh, instrument you were playing, 
be it a piano or a drum or a guitar or a saxophone or a clarinet or a trumpet or I could go on for a long, long time. Uh, when you first hit it, that's the attack. You want to, depending on what the song calls for, you want a different type of attack. And finally, we have the third form of attack. It's not the last word, but it's the last form of attack. It is an adjective from 1899. Designed, planned, or used for carrying out a military attack. As in, an attack helicopter. Next, we have attack dog. Two words. This is a noun from 1970. One, a dog trained to attack on command or on sight. Two, a person noted for harsh personal, and usually public verbal attacks against others, as in a political attack dog. Release the hounds. Next, we have attack man, all one word. Ooh, that reminds me of Pac-Man. Attack, pack, a pack, attack, a pack, a Pac-Man. Uh, is he an attack man? He attacks those ghosts and those uh, pellets. What are they called? Pebble. P- the, p- the pellet things. Uh, all right, this is a noun from 1940. A player, as in lacrosse, assigned to an offensive zone or position. Next, we have attain. This is a verb from the 14th century. Transitive definitions are first. One, to reach as an end. Synonyms are gain and achieve, as in attain a goal. Two, to come into possession of. Synonym is obtain, as in, he attained preferment over his fellows. Three, to come to as the end of a progression or course of movement, as in, they attained the top of the hill. Also as in, attain a ripe old age. Intransitive definitions, uh, just one of them. To come or arrive by motion, growth or effort. Usually that is used with the word to. So attain to, I guess, or to to attain, either one, doesn't give me an example. Attainability is a noun, and attainable is an adjective. And this is from Middle English, attainen, uh, which is from Anglo-French, attain, uh, with a dash, so that's probably a prefix. Uh, that is a stem of attendre, atten- how do you say that? A-T-E-I-N-D-R-E, attendre, Ugh. I can't say those those special uh, consonants or words or whatever in French, attendre, uh, which means to reach or accomplish or convict. Uh, And that is from uh, V Latin, uh, I can't remember, verite Latin? I don't remember. Uh, Latin attangere, which is an alternative of Latin attingere with an I. uh, And that is from ad plus tangere, which means to touch. And there's more at the word tangent. Uh, okay, we are going to do one more for this episode. It is attainder. So it's like attain, A-T-T-A-I-N, with a D-E-R at the end. Attainder. This is a noun from the 15th century. One, extinction of the civil rights and capacities of a person upon sentence of death or outlawry, outlawry, usually after a conviction of treason. Outlawry? How do you say that word? Outlawry. It's like outlaw with an R-Y. And the number two definition is obsolete. It just has the synonym dishonor. Uh, Not a word that uh, is used every day. Um, All right. What is the word of the episode? I'm still trying to think of a a quote from the birdcage. Um, The first one I can think of is, uh, may I take your jacket as usual or for the very first time? That's not how he says it, though. Um, anyway, uh, what is the word of the episode? Uh, did we start? I think we started with attache. Um, but I'm going to pick attack man because it's fun to say that is the word of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. Tell your friends who like funky words and people talking. Uh, and, uh, hopefully I'll get, I'll get some more guest readers in here soon. Um, so the holidays are coming up. I'm going to be with a bunch of members of my family, um, between Christmas and New Year's. Um, and so I will probably do at least one episode of a live recording. I'm flipping ahead to see where the end is. Um, yeah, I'll probably do at least one live recording with them. Um, it may be the last episode for the letter A or the last two, or I'll pick something in the middle. I have no idea. I'll figure that out later. Thank you and goodbye.
Hello, word nerds. What's up with you? I'm doing just fine. Thank you for asking. Um, we are at the top of the second column of page 79, and that is the third quarter, uh, if you couldn't figure that out. All right, the first word for this episode is attainment, A-T-T-A-I-N. M-E-N-T. This is a noun from 1549. One, the act of attaining. The condition of being attained. Number two, something attained. And a synonym is accomplishment. It feels very good when you have accomplished something. Don't you think? Next we have attaint. A-T-T-A-I-N-T. The first form of two. This is a transitive verb from the 14th century. One, to affect by attainder. And if you remember from the end of the last episode, attainder has a couple of definitions. Um, One form of it was dishonor. That's a synonym. Uh, Let's see. Back to attaint. 2A, we have the synonyms infect and corrupt. 2B is archaic, and we have the synonyms taint I have a feeling that's a very old version of the word uh, that many of you might think of. Um, And also, sully. Um, Actually, yes, no, sorry, backtrack. Uh, Yes, when you you taint something, you sully it. You, uh, I guess you attaint it. Um, And number three is also archaic, archaic, and it is the synonym accuse. No definition there. And that's it for that one. Now we are going to move on to the second form of a taint. This is a noun from 1592. It is obsolete, and it says, A stain upon honor or purity. Synonym is disgrace. Now we have atter. I think that's how it's pronounced, or it could be uh, atter. No, there's. I, I still am not completely sure how an A sounds when you put an umlaut over it. Is it Ah, it's not a because that has the the line over it. Um, atter or atter, at atter, one of those. It is spelled a t t a r. Uh, okay, this is interesting. It says also auto a oh sorry o t t o, auto. Um, and that also shows an a with an umlaut for the first syllable. So that's ah. So ah. Atar, Atar. Maybe that's how the other one was uh, pronounced. But it's interesting that it's a completely different spelling. Otto and Atar, Atar. Okay, this is a noun from 1798. A fragrant essential oil, as from rose petals. Also, the synonym fragrance. I spent more time on just how to pronounce the word than anything else. Um, this is from Persian. Atir, A-T-I-R, which means perfumed, and that is from Arabic, uh, itr, I-T-R, which means perfume. Now we have the word attempt. This is a transitive verb from the 14th century. One, to make an effort to do, accomplish, solve, or effect, as in attempted to swim the swollen river. Sounds like a quote from something, but it doesn't tell me who it is from. Uh, Okay, number two is archaic, and we just have the synonym tempt. Number three is also archaic, and it says to try to subdue or take by force. All right, we have, uh, okay, we have a synonym. It is the word attack, and attemptable is an adjective. The etymology says this is from Latin attemptare, uh, which is from ad plus temptare, which means to touch or try. And there is more at the word tempt. And we have some synonym information. Attempt, try, endeavor, essay, or strive mean to make an effort to accomplish an end. Attempt stresses the initiation or beginning of an effort as in, will attempt to photograph the rare bird. Try is often close to attempt, but may stress effort or experiment made in the hope of testing or proving something, as in, tried to determine which was the better procedure. Endeavor heightens the implications of 
exertion, exertion, yep, it goes over to the second line, and difficulty, as in endeavored to find crash survivors in the mountains. Uh, yeah, they, they might appreciate that. Essay, E-S-S-A-Y, implies difficulty, but also suggests tentative trying or experimenting, as in well essay, sorry, will essay a dramatic role for the first time. I don't think I've ever heard the word essay used in this form. Uh, to me, it's always just, you know, you got to write an essay f- uh, for class. Uh, okay, strive implies great exertion against great difficulty and specifically suggests persistent effort, as in continues to strive for peace. I am doing that. Now we have the second form of the word attempt. This is a noun from 1534. 1A, the act or an instance of attempting, especially an unsuccessful effort. 1B, something resulting from or representing an attempt, as in surrounded by a few attempts at rose bushes. And that is from Marion Engel, E-N-G-E-L. Uh, we have number two. Oh, yes. Number two, we have the synonyms attack and assault, as in an attempt on the life of the president. No comment. And next, we have the word attend. This is a verb from the 14th century. We will start with the transitive definitions. One, to pay attention to. Two, to look after, take charge of, as in campsites attended by park rangers and that is a quote Uh, it's very basic but it's a quote i guess from jackson rivers 3a to go or stay with as a companion nurse or servant 3b to visit professionally especially as a physician 4 where did it go is archaic Uh, so there's 4a and 4b those are both archaic Uh, 4a says to wait for For B, to be in store for. Five, to be present with. Synonym is accompany. Six, to be present at or go to, as in attend law school. And here we go with the intransitive definitions. One, to apply oneself, as in attend to your homework. It sounds like something my grandparents probably said to my dad. Go attend to your your work. Well, it it says work. I added, I think I added the home. Attend to your work. But they probably still told him that anyway. Number two, to apply the mind or pay attention. Synonym is heed, H-E-E-D. 3A, to be ready for service, as in ministers who attend upon the king. Uh, 3B, to be present. 4 is obsolete. And we have the synonyms wait and stay. Five, to direct one's attention. Synonym is see, S-E-E, like I see you. Uh, But I don't, but maybe I do. As in, I'll attend to that. Attender is a noun. And we will do one more for this episode. It is the word attendance, A-T-T-E-N-D-A-N-C-E. This is a noun. Uh, Oh, and I'm realizing I skipped the etymology for attend. So let's do that now. Uh, This is from Anglo-French, attendre. It has that pesky D-R-E at the end, uh, which is from the Latin attendere, which literally means to stretch to. And that is from ad plus tendere, which means to stretch. And there's more at the word thin. Okay, now we have the word attendance. Sorry about that. It's a noun from the 14th century. One, the act or fact of attending, as in a physician in attendance. 2A, the persons, yeah, that's plural, the persons or number of persons attending. Also, an account of persons attending, as in the teacher took attendance before starting class. I am sure most of you, uh, maybe not those who were homeschooled, uh, but most of you are very familiar with this process. At the beginning of class, they take attendance and you say, here, or what's up, or yeah, that's me. All right, and to be the number of times a person attends. And we didn't have a lot of words in this episode 
but I still have to pick one as the word of the episode. Um, ba, 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 do, ba, ba. We're going to pick that word that I had a hard time pronouncing, otter, or otter, or otto. Uh, it is spelled A-T-T-A-R. That's the word of the episode. That is the end of this episode. We are um, almost in the middle of December. I don't know why I said that. I just have these little post-it notes that tell me uh, what days are for which page. And uh, that's it. Thank you for listening. Uh, Until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. And it's very possible tomorrow's episode will have a guest reader. We'll find out in mere moments. Okay, goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to this episode of The Dictionary. I am so excited to be talking to you. Aren't you excited that I'm talking to you as well? Um, I'm going to try and kill a little time because I'm waiting for my possible guest reader to maybe hop in this room and uh, get on the mic. Um, But it might not happen. I haven't heard back from him, so we'll see. Um, So what do I have to say? I don't know if I have anything to say, actually. Uh, So let's just go ahead and talk about some words in a very slow way. The first word for this episode is attendance officer. Two words. The normal word attendance and the normal word officer. Uh, This is a noun from 1884. And we just have the synonym truant officer. One time I... It's not worth going into the story, but I basically got in trouble at school uh, for something very stupid. And my mom told me I was in high school, I think. Um, and so and then my mom told me that once when she was maybe junior high or high school, uh, she skipped school with a friend of hers. And this must have been in the 60s, I guess. Um And her and her friend got in trouble by a truant officer. I wasn't really familiar with the word truant at that time. Maybe I had heard it once or twice, but um, I have heard it more since then. But uh, I don't know. I just thought that was funny that my mom was admitting to me that she got in trouble by a truant. I guess maybe uh, it was truancy officer, but this says truant officer. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, Are they just normal cops that... uh, only look for kids who are skipping school or how does that work what exactly is a truant officer um and uh yeah so i think our guest reader is not going to be joining me today that is okay so we are going to move on to the word attendant it is the first form uh it is a noun from the 15th century one one who attends another to perform a service especially an employee who waits on customers. Two, something that accompanies. Synonym is concomitant. That is spelled C-O-N-C-O-M-I-T-A-N-T. Number three, we just have the synonym attendee. Now we have the second form of attendant. This is an adjective from the 15th century. One, accompanying, waiting upon, or following in order to perform service. As in cherub and seraph, attendant on their lord. Oh, that's the end of the sentence. Uh, and that is a quote from John Milton. Uh, that This is definitely a way to use the word that I am not familiar with. Number two, accompanying or following as a consequence or result, as in problems attendant on pollution, also as in civilization and its attendant morality. And that is from Robert Stone. Next, we have attendee. This is a noun from 1937. A person who is present on a given occasion or at a given place, as in attendees at a convention. Now we have attending with an ing at the end. This is the first form. It is an adjective from circa 1923, serving as a physician on the staff of a teaching hospital. Uh, serving as a physician on the staff of a teaching hospital, as in an attending surgeon. And oftentimes uh, you will hear it just as the word attending, like that is the attending. Um, Yeah, they'll just end it there. Uh, Maybe this is what that is. This is the second form of attending. It is a noun from 1951, an attending physician or surgeon. 
Next, we have attention. This is, uh, oh, it's giving me some extra information in italic. Sense for is often, ah, okay, so the fourth definition has a slightly different uh, pronunciation, which is attention with with no atten attention and atten attention. Yeah, it ends with a T sound for number four, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, okay, so this is a noun from the 14th century. 1A, the act or state of applying the mind to something. 1B, a condition of readiness for such attention involving especially a selective narrowing or focus of consciousness and receptivity. Number two, we have the synonyms observation and notice, especially consideration with a view to action, as in a problem requiring prompt attention. 3a, an act of civility or courtesy, especially in courtship as in, she welcomed his attentions. And that is a plural, attentions. 3b, sympathetic consideration of the needs and wants of others. Synonym is attentiveness. Everybody wants some attentiveness. Number four, uh, so this is the one that supposedly is pronounced attention. Atten, attention. Yeah. Number four, a position assumed by a soldier with heels together, body erect, arms at the sides, and eyes to the front, often used as a command. Uh, so, yes, I'm very familiar with that that thing where they have them go to attention, uh, but it's pronounced a little bit differently. So I may have to see if I can find an example of that online, of somebody saying it in this other way. Attentional is an adjective, and we are going to skip the etymology. Next, we have attention deficit disorder, three separate words. This is a noun from 1978, a syndrome of disordered learning and disruptive behavior that is not caused by any serious underlying physical or mental disorder and that has several subtypes characterized primarily by symptoms of inattentiveness or primarily by symptoms of hyperactivity and impulse behavior as speaking out of turn or by the significant expression of all three, and it is abbreviated to ADD. This is a very tough topic. I feel like maybe I mentioned it a while ago. Uh, we probably came across the abbreviation ADD. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know if there's a, a newer term uh, used to describe this. There's a lot of contention around, you know, why more and more kids are being diagnosed with ADD um, or ADHD, which is our next one. Um, yeah, it's this is a complicated issue. Is it just be kids being kids or is there actually something going on? I think there's a lot of disorders. I put that in air quotes um, that d doctors or therapists or physicians or whoever are claiming as real disorders, but maybe it's not really a thing. I don't know. I don't know a lot about that. Anyway, we are going to move on to attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, and so in this case, attention deficit has a hyphen in between them. Uh, in the previous one, it did not. Um, but there's also a slash between deficit and hyperactivity. So it's kind of one or the other. I guess that's what it's saying. Uh, all right, this is a noun from 1987, uh, nine years after the other one. Uh, and it just has the synonym attention deficit disorder. So what we just read, and it is abbreviated as ADHD. Uh, I, I've never really seen them used interchangeably like that. Uh, I always thought ADHD was kind of a more extreme version of ADD, but I could be wrong about that. Next, we have attention line. This is two words. It is a noun from 1925. A line usually placed above the salutation in a business letter directing the letter to one specified. Next is attention span. Two words. This is a noun from 1934. The length of time during which one, as an individual or a group, is able to concentrate or remain interested. I think the attention span of people... Younger people specifically is getting less and less with every year, every generation, or, or getting shorter and shorter, I should say, not less and less. Um, a lot of people say it's the MTV generation or whatever, 
Uh, I say or whatever a lot, by the way. Um, yeah, I mean, I think with the ability, I don't know, you look at uh, films, say, or TV or whatever, or whatever, and uh, their edits get faster and faster, and so um, attention spans are shorter. We need shorter videos and things, and it's, uh, yes, yeah, so our attention span is definitely shorter and shorter. Um, maybe let's take a conscious effort and try and expand our attention span, I- extend it a little bit more. Uh, you know, we don't need things super fast. Anyway, we are going to move on to attentive. This is an adjective from the 14th century. One, we have the synonyms mindful and observant, as in attentive to what he is doing. Number two, heedful of the comfort of others. And a synonym is solicitous, S-O-L-I-C-I-T-O-U-S, as in an attentive waitress. Uh, it is helpful when the waitstaff is attentive, but sometimes, um, it, this is even in like um, uh, retail stores as well, sometimes I feel like they can be a little too attentive, um, but that's my own personal issue. Number three, offering attentions in or as if in the role of a suitor. Attentively is an adverb and attentiveness is a noun. We are going to do two more, but they are the same word, forms one and forms two. It is the word attentuate, uh, attent, attenuate, attenuate? Yes, it is the word attenuate or attenuate or attenuate or ten, yeah, same, or atten, tenu, tenu, attenuate. So many forms. I thought it was atten, ten, attenuate. Yeah, A-T-T-E-N-U-A-T-E. This is an adjective from the 15th century. One, reduced especially in thickness, density, or force. Number two, tapering gradually. uh, Let's try that again. Tapering gradually, usually to a long, slender point, as in attenuate leaves. Or, yeah, attenuate leaves. Uh, The etymology says this is from the Latin attenuatus, which is from the verb attenuare, which means to make thin. And that is from ad plus tenuous, which means thin, and there's more at the word thin. And now we have the second form of attenuate. Uh, Yeah, this one ends in eight, and the previous one ended in it. Attenuate, this is attenuate. This is a verb from 1530. Transitive definitions are first. One, to make thin or slender. Two, to make thin in consistency. Synonym is rarify. Number three, to lessen the amount, force, magnitude, or value of. Synonym is weaken. Four, to reduce the severity, virulence, or vitality of, as in an attenuated virus. And the intransitive definition says to become thin, fine, or less. And attenuation is a noun. Now, it's the word of the episode day thing time, and I am going to pick, uh, I'm going to pick attention deficit disorder. Uh, I don't really feel like I ever had this. I was never diagnosed with it, definitely. I know people who have been diagnosed with it, um, whether or not they really had it, I don't know. Is it a thing that people can grow out of? Is it a thing that really exists? Is it, do they, is it something that they keep for the rest of the, the rest of their lives? I don't know. It's a complicated issue. Um, and you know, again, with our attention spans getting shorter and shorter, it's easier to have ADD, uh, and you just want to look for the next thing, or you can't focus on something for too long. Uh, but you know, when you find something that you can focus on, um, maybe you can focus on it. I don't know. That's the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. Next is page 80. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds, and welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. This is my podcast. Thank you for listening and joining me. Uh, I am recording this in the morning, so I am taking advantage of the lower tones of my voice that I cannot usually get to. Uh, I don't usually record in the morning. Let's see how long I can keep this up. You probably hate this. The first word for this episode is attenuator. 
uh, or Atenuat, yeah, it's something like that. A T T E N U A T O R. This is a noun from 1924, a device for attenuating, especially one for reducing the amplitude of an electrical signal without appreciable distortion. Uh, yeah, you don't really want distortion if you don't want it. You don't want it because you don't want it. Uh, next, we have a test. A-T-T-E-S-T. I feel like I'm taking a test talking about all these words. This is a verb from circa 1500. We'll start with the transitive uh, definitions. 1A, to affirm to be true or genuine, specifically to authenticate by signing as a witness. 1B, to authenticate officially. 2, to establish or verify the usage of. 3, Sorry, while I scratch my nose. Number three, to be proof of. Synonym is manifest, as in her record, uh, where'd it go? Her record attests her integrity. Number four, to put on oath. Now we have the intransitive definition that looks like there's just one. To bear witness. Synonym is testify, as in attest to a belief. And we have a synonym at the end. It says, uh, see the word certify. Attestation is a noun. I think that's how it's pronounced. Attestation, yep. And attester is also a noun. And the etymology says this is from Middle French attester, from Latin attestari, which is from ad plus testis, which means witness. And there's more at the word testament. Now we have the word attic. A-T-T-I-C. This is a noun from circa 1696. One, a low story or wall above the main order of a facade in the classical styles. Number two, a room behind an attic. What? So an attic is behind an attic? They couldn't have come up with another word for that room behind an attic? I love those secret rooms. There, it's not a secret room, but you know, attics are cool and weird, and rooms behind them, those are cool and weird. I don't know. Number three, a room or a space immediately below the roof of a building. Synonym is garret, G A R R E T. Number four, something resembling an attic, as in being used for storage. Uh, yeah. Now we have uh, attic again. Uh, oh, wait, no, there is a, there's a little bit of etymolo etymology. Uh, it is French attique with a Q-U-E at the end, which is from Attica with a capital A, uh, which is from the Latin Atticus. Uh, so I of Attica, attique means of Attica. Is Attica a, a oh, you know what? That's a little sneak peek into what's coming up. You're going to learn about that a little bit more. All right, now we have the first form of attic with a capital A. This is an adjective from 1599. One, of relating to or having the characteristics of Athens or its ancient civilization. Number two, marked by simplicity, purity, and refinement, as in an attic prose style. And the etymology says this is Latin atticus, which it means of Attica, which is from the Greek word atticos, which is from the word attike or attiki, which means Attica, Greece. So Attica is in Greece. Um, and I know that the first definition in the previous word attic uh, had to do with the facade in the classical style. Um, you know, so that's that's the original. It sounds like that's the original definition of the word attic. Uh, they, you know, they use them in their old architecture, but I still don't fully understand where, how it's connected to the town attic. Was that the first place uh, that they named it? I don't know. Uh, all right, so we finished that. Now we are going to move on to the second form of attic with a capital A. This is a noun from circa 1771, a dialect of ancient Greek originally used in Attica, and later, the literary language of the Greek-speaking world. Uh, so it's a dialect of ancient Greek. Attic. I didn't know that, obviously. Now we have uh, Atticism. Atticism. 
uh, they just added an ISM at the end of the word attic. Uh, it is a noun and it is often capitalized. It is from 1593. One, a witty or well turned phrase. Number two, a characteristic feature. Uh, that's not the way you say that. A characteristic feature of Attic Greek occurring in another language or dialect. So when you're talking about the Attic dialect, you'd say Attic Greek. I guess those don't flow very well together, unfortunately. Not in English, at least. A characteristic feature of Attic Greek occurring in another language or dialect. That's what that one says. Now we have the word attire. Uh, it is what you wear. It is not the thing on your car. It is the first form. It is a transitive verb from the 14th century. To put garments on. Synonyms are dress and array. Especially to clothe in fancy or rich garments. I never attire of hearing people talk about attire. Uh, let's see, etymology says, this is from Anglo-French, attirer, which means to equip, equip, there was a P there, uh, or prepare, or attire, from A plus tire, which means to order or rank, and I'm guessing because that was Latin or French, I don't know how they pronounce tire, T-I-R-E, is it tire, uh, is it pronounced some other way, uh, but that means again, order, rank, or uh, it is of Germanic origin, and it is akin to the Old English uh, tier, T-I-R, with an accent over the I, which means glory or ornament. Now we have the second form of attire. It is a noun from the 14th century. So this is probably what you are attiring yourself with. You attire yourself with attire uh, when you're attired, you just got out of bed. Number one. Synonyms are dress and clothes, especially splendid or decorative clothing. Number two, the antlers or antlers and scalp of a stag or buck. Uh, so that flowed very strangely. It is the antlers or antlers and scalp of a stag or buck. They call that the attire, I guess. Now we have attitude. This is a noun from 1668. One, the arrangement of the parts of a body or figure. Synonym is posture. Number two, a position assumed for a specific purpose, as in a threatening attitude. I just love saying the word attitude. I don't know why. Number three, a ballet position assumed for a specific purpose. No, we skipped a line or we went back a line. Number three, a, a ballet position similar to the arabesque in which the raised leg is bent at the knee. 4a. A mental position with regard to a fact or state, as in a helpful attitude. 4b. A feeling or emotion toward a fact or state. 5. The position of an aircraft or spacecraft determined by the relationship between its axes and a reference datum as the horizon hori horizon jeez what how what as the horizon or a particular star uh yeah if you look down uh out at the horizon uh you might see a ship uh, i don't know uh that's where the sun the sun rays uh the sun rays happens at the horizon number 6 an organismic state of readiness to respond in a characteristic way to a stimulus as an ad, uh, as an, what? Uh, man, I keep on skipping lines. I even put my finger here to help me, but it's not helping. Um, okay, let's try six again. An organismic state of readiness to respond in a characteristic way to a stimulus as an object, concept, or situation. I think I get more confused when I record in the mornings because uh, I'm tired, I guess. Seven A. A negative or hostile state of mind. Oh, I don't like that kind of attitude. Please keep your negative and hostile attitude away from me. I shall I shall ban you from my bubble. Uh, 7B. A cool, cocky, defiant, or arrogant manner. Uh, all right. That is attitude. Oh, we got some uh, etymology. Uh, this is French. And it's from the Italian. Attitudine which literally means aptitude, with an A-P-T at the front. Uh, and this is from Latin aptitudin, 
or aptitudo, which means fitness. Ooh, let's do some fitnessing. Uh, and there's more at the word aptitude. We have one more word for this episode. It is attitudinal. No, geez. Attitudinal. A T T I T U D I N A L. I think I got so excited to say the word attitudinal that I said it wrong. Uh, this is an adjective from 1831 relating to based on or expressive of personal attitudes or feelings. And uh, as in attitudinal judgment. Attitudinally is an adverb. How many syllables does that have? Attitudinally. Six syllables. Uh, That's a lot. The etymology says this is from attitude plus the suffix I-N-A-L, inal, um, as in aptitudinal. Uh, And it's from Latin aptitudin or aptitudo, two words that we saw before, and that's it. And that's the end of the etymology. That's the end of the definition. That is almost the end of the episode. We are going to pick... Um, I liked I liked attitude, but I think I'm going to pick uh, the... One of the attic words. Which one? Well, I can just say one. Well, no, the other one has a capital. Uh, let's just pick the word attic with no capitalization as the word of the episode... Uh, maybe I can see if I can find a cool picture of a creepy old attic. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye.